I'm Sam Sacasa from NABC's Vetfolio and the host of this Tech Takeover edition of vet to vet Today we're talking about the top eight myths pet owners have about dental care and giving veterinary technicians talking points they can use to dispel these misconceptions when talking to pet owners. Dental guru Mary Berg is here to share her wealth of knowledge. With lots of experience and practice and more than 22 years of experience in dental product research, she's the perfect person to talk to about this. Mary is also going to share some of her favorite dental tips and tricks. Hi Mary, I'm so excited to have you here with us today. Hi Sam, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and share my favorite topic. Well, let's jump right into these top eight myths with a little countdown. Number eight, oral disease is just a normal part of companion animal aging. Well, that's false. Animals um, with regular dental care, routine plaque removal at home, and that can be really mean daily, um, and good annual cleanings can actually have their full set of teeth when they're seniors, there's no reason we have to have those teeth lost. So if we think about our own teeth, we go to the dentist every six months, um, keep our teeth brushed and things like that. We hopefully will have our teeth all of our lives. So it is really a myth that dogs will, it's just part of aging, they're gonna lose their teeth. That's not true at all. Kind of correlating it to people and the expectations that we have for our own dental health is maybe a good way to explain it to pet owners. Actually, I use um, compare, um, anytime I'm talking to a pet owner about dentistry, I compare it to a lot of what we do in our own mouths, what we do when we go to our dentist, what our hygienist does, so that it is a little bit more relatable to them. Um, because basically the disease process is pretty much the same between companion animals and humans. Number seven, dogs and cats do not feel pain from dental disease. Well, that's one of these topics that is, you know, there's different viewpoints on that. And I actually believe that they do feel pain. We all know that dog that has come in or cat has come in and and when we get the mouth cleaned up and we talk to the pet owner, you know, a few days afterwards, they're like, oh my God, they're a puppy again. Well, part of that is probably because it was painful and they just didn't feel very good. So we know that a fractured tooth can hurt, an abscess tooth can hurt. Um, but our dogs and cats are very good at hiding pain. They don't want to have that, um, you know, that impression that they're painful because they want to make us happy. So we want to make sure that we are watching them closely. And an animal who, you know, may drop food when they're eating or only chews on one side of their mouth, um, you know, purposefully only chews on one side of their mouth is probably experiencing some type of pain. I think that's a really great way to explain it, actually letting owners know um, those clues that an animal is in pain and especially in dental pain because they may not know what that looks like. I think it's also really important that we let them know that um, dental pain can happen very gradually and they may not notice the changes um, because it's kind of a, you know, they see them every day. So we do want to make sure they understand that, you know, dropping food, chewing on one side, a cat who may hiss at the water bowl um, can all be signs of, dent of dental problems. Okay, number six. Bones, chew toys, and tennis balls will help keep my pet's mouth healthy. Well, not really. Um, we have to consider that a dog's jaw does not hinge side to side. Like we bite down on a jawbreaker and our jaw just kind of hinges over to the side because we can shift our jaw. A dog can't. And when they chew on that deer antler or that cow hoof or that real bone, it actually, the shearing force can cause tooth fractures instead of actually cleaning the teeth like we think it would. And um, so we have to make sure that we educate our pet owners on what is a safe toy and what is a good toy to give the pet. And my rule of thumb is if I can't easily bend it between my two hands, or if I can't um, stick my fingernail in it, um, I'm not going to give it to my dog because it is going to cause them to have a shearing fracture um, because of the chewing of it. So that's one thing to consider. Um, wild animals, wild dogs, wild, you know, like wolves and things like that actually have a lot of fractures in their mouths because they are eating natural diets. So we have to kind of also educate our pet owners on that. When it comes to tennis balls, oh my gosh, um, Tennis balls are a dog's best friend, right? They love them. They want to carry them around. But if you look at a tennis ball, like even a brand new one, fresh out of the package, it's rough. 
it's a great exfoliator, just saying, but it's, it's really rough. And if that dog chews on that all the time, and then you want add a little saliva and dirt into it, it's going to become a, a wear the teeth away, basically. So we want to make sure that, you know, pet owners know that it's okay to play fetch with the tennis ball, but take it away when the game is over and keep it away from the pet. So they're not chewing on it nonstop. Um, I have seen dogs with basically their teeth worn down all the way to the gum line from constant chewing on tennis balls. So it's important that we educate our pet owners on what's a good toy, what's a bad toy. Okay, number five, and this is a big one, because I know there's been a lot of false information used in marketing about this. Feeding a hard kibble will keep my pet's teeth clean. Well, I know I was raised with that thought that, you right. know, feeding kibble keeps my dog's teeth clean. I don't have to worry about anything else. Well, most dogs and cats will actually swallow their food whole, um, especially if it's a small kibble. That's really not giving them any dental benefit whatsoever. And even those who do chew the food, the kibbles are out there so hard that when the tooth hits it, it actually just crumbles apart and doesn't scrub the tooth as we think it does. So it's advantageous to use something like a dental diet that is designed to actually let the tooth penetrate it and squeegee off the plaque for better way of saying it. So it's it's made of a special matrix so that when the tooth actually penetrates it, it actually brushes that plaque off the teeth as opposed to just a regular hard kibble diet. And number four, tooth brushing is too difficult. My pets hate it and it really doesn't help anyway. You're, you're, not, a, you're not alone. Um, realistically, uh, I think it's less than 2% of Americans brush their pet's teeth, which is sad because we know it's the gold standard and it's going to be the best option for our pets, but it is something that can, it, it isn't difficult if we train our pet and we take our time to train the pet to do it, um, but it does take time. It's not something that you're just gonna sit down and do right away. And we really have to take time in our practices to educate our clients how to do it correctly. And that is going to be to start slowly. And it's gonna take a few weeks before that pet readily accepts toothbrushing. But I usually start with the paste on my finger um, and I'll actually hold their mouth closed. So my finger, my hands are like a C over their muzzle. And I just gently tape that, take my finger in and just rub maybe the canines and incisors. And that's gonna be a few days doing that. Every time the pet readily accepts it, we give them a reward, whether it's a treat, a game of fetch, their favorite, you know, go for a walk, whatever. Um, as they start to accept it, then I'm going to go back farther in the mouth. And I like doing this with my finger or my finger wrapped with a piece of gauze. Then after that's readily acceptable, I'll introduce a toothbrush. And the toothbrush is going to be, um, I prefer a real toothbrush. I'm not a fan of the finger brushes, but a real toothbrush with a little paste on it. And then again, slowly start with that. And a lot of praise and a lot of reward um, to make the pet realize that, hey, mom's going to do this really crazy thing to me, but if I behave, I get to go play, you know, play fetch. So I'm going to do what I need to do to behave. Um, and it can be acceptable, but it does take sometimes many weeks to train. It is also advantageous for the pet owners to realize to do it at the same time of day, um, kind of make it a real habit. So they're doing it daily and the same time of day and the animal starts to really accept it. As we were saying, some people just don't like to brush the teeth because it does take time and it's it's kind of a hassle to learn how to do it. But another really great option for pet owners to keep those pet or those pets' teeth clean is to do dental wipes. Um, these are usually a little round um, wipe that you can get with, and you just actually wipe the outside of the pet's teeth once a day with it. And it's really pretty cool because the pet owners can now look at that wipe once they wipe the teeth, and they can actually see the plaque that they've come off that's come off that tooth and it makes them feel like they've done a really great job. So dental wipes are always a great option. It always kind of amazes me that people will be willing to wipe the teeth but they don't want to brush. So it's a it's a great option for pet owners to um, offer those wipes to the to the pet owner. Yeah, I think it's a great idea to sort of explain those different steps. Like first you're just, you know, massaging the tooth and then you're using a piece of gauze and sort of how you outlined it. Um, because I see a lot of owners get really frustrated when it doesn't work. And so I think understanding that this is supposed to be a timely process, especially maybe if they 
um, adopted an adult animal that has never experienced this before um, is really valuable. One other thing to remember to tell your pet owners too is that they really only need to worry about brushing the outside of the teeth. And that makes it a little bit easier. We don't have to brush the, you know, the lingual or palatal aspects because the pet really keeps those clean if we keep the outside clean. So, you know, that's one thing to also remind them. And then also, you know, if it's an older pet that they've adopted, they may want to have the oral cavity, um, you know, an exam on that because if it is a painful mouth, toothbrushing isn't going to be fun for anybody. So we need to make sure the pet is able to accept it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, would you say that this process also works well in cats? It does. And yes, yeah. you can brush cat's teeth. Um, <laughs> you can. Uh, it, it, it Sometimes it's really relaxing uh, for the pet. At, at first, they kind of look at you like, oh my God, what is this person doing? But they do actually kind of relax after they get used to that, having their teeth brushed. And Again, same principle, same time every day, um, you know, just kind of keeping their mouth closed with your finger underneath their chin and just gently massaging. Um, there are cat toothbrushes out there, uh, but you can get like a pediatric human brush with soft bristles and it'll work fairly well too. I love that. And again, I just love the idea of just letting owners know, like be patient with this process um, and that it can eventually work. And like you said, be relaxing for the pet. That's yeah. really cool. Number three, anesthesia is scary and dangerous, so non-anesthetic dental cleanings is the way to go. I know I've definitely heard this one. Well, we always know there's going to be a risk anytime we have anesthesia. However, because of the fact that our dogs don't sit in a chair, open their mouth wide and say, ah, while well, we're cleaning their teeth, like we do, it can be um, almost misleading to the pet owners to think that it's actually doing a good job. We are using sharp instruments and we're going below the gum line, which is not fun uh, for us to have done, much less to a patient who doesn't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So we wanna make sure that the pet owner understands that if we don't clean below the gum line, we're really not doing any justice to that pet. Um, the teeth might be white, but the disease happens below the gum line. So it is important that we explain the reason anesthesia-free dentistry is not really an option. It also can create a lot of stress to that pet. Um, they're sitting there going, oh my gosh, what are these guys doing to me? And you know, it, it's, it's just not a good idea in the long run. I do recommend if, if it is something you're concerned about or you have clients who uh, are interested in it, you can go to the ABDC website and there is a position statement on the ABDC website that discusses uh, anesthesia-free dentistry and the risks that are that are associated with it. It actually, in some ways to me, is very dangerous because it puts a false sense of security in the pet owner because the teeth look white, but they're really not healthy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then for owners that are nervous about anesthesia, especially maybe in an older pet, how do you sort of calm their nerves about it? Well, I explain that, you know, and this is what we did in my practice, but we always ran um, pre-anesthetic blood work, or as I right. like to refer to it as surgical safety blood work beforehand. It's just kind of a warm, fuzzy name for it. And then we're always going to have a dedicated anesthetist, somebody who is standing right there, who is monitoring anesthesia while the dental procedure is being done. Because if we are trying to do that all by ourselves as one person, we're gonna miss things. So we wanna make sure we have um, that dedicated anesthetist and not just rely on our machines and our monitors um, and give them everything we can do, everything we do at our practice to, to really make sure that patient is as safe as possible. That can mean customized anesthetic protocols, depending on the patient's age or, or any other comorbidities. Um, and also always think about if you have a patient who could really um, benefit from a dental cleaning, who might be a senior or has a co comorbidity, it is okay to refer them to a veterinary dentist. Many of the veterinary dentists actually work side by side with boarded anesthesiologists. So they have that little bit more of a, se a security net um, with them when they're working with those senior pets or those comorbidities. Number two. Bad breath is normal in pets. Absolutely not. 
Um, dogs do have an odor to their breath, even when it's healthy, but it's not an offensive odor. But when we have dental disease and we have periodontal disease, those bacteria that get below the gum line start to change to a different type of bacteria and they actually produce something called thiols. And thiols is what almost gives that rotten egg smell, um, you know, that really nasty smell to our animal's breath, that kind of halitosis. Um, and when if we can prevent that from happening, we don't have to have bad breath. It, it's not necessary. I mean, keeping that mouth clean, those dogs can have a normal dog breath, but not disease dog breath, I guess is what I'm trying to say, where it's like, oh my God, you know, your eyes are watering or the ones that I always joke that you could smell from the parking lot coming in because of the periodontal disease. But it is not necessary. If you keep that mouth healthy, they don't get that bacteria below the gum line. It doesn't change into those back, black pigmenting bacteria that put off the thiols. So it's not a, definitely a false statement all the way around. Yeah, and I think that's a great thing to convey to owners because I do think that's a big misconception. And even just equating it to bacteria like you did, I think is a great visual for owners. I use the word infection a lot yeah. instead of periodontal disease because people don't really understand what periodontal disease is. But if I say it's an infection, most people really get what that is. Yeah, I love that. And finally, number one, white teeth equals a healthy mouth. Absolutely untrue. Okay. I honestly don't really, when I'm looking at a pet's mouth, I don't really look at the teeth themselves. I'm going to look at the gums and the gingiva. What is happening there? That's where my, my, my interest is because that's where the disease is happening. That's where the infection is happening. So a lot of people get really kind of, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a grade three out of four calculus or tartar. I don't really worry about that. What do the gums look like? That's where the most important part is to remember. So like I said, sometimes those white teeth aren't necessarily healthy if the if the gums are red and inflamed and swollen, maybe even bleeding, there's something going on we need to address. These are things that really make sense to us, but it's such a good reminder to talk to our clients about these things. So we've got our clients on board with regular dental care in the home and in the practice. Do you have a few tips to help us give the best dental care possible? Yes, I do. Um, actually, I'm going to start with uh, one of my um, one of my most favorite things to talk about is that is having the right equipment to do the job correctly, and that means that you have the right dental instruments and sharp dental instruments. Um, it's, it's something, if I don't have the right instrument, I can't do the job correctly. And if I'm working with a dull instrument, it's gonna make my job much harder. So having, um, learning how to, you know, sharpen those elevators for my veterinarian when they're doing extractions uh, can make that procedure so much better for them. Um, learning how to do those things, how to keep your scalers, your hand scalers and your curettes sharp, all make a huge difference for the speed of that procedure. That makes so much sense. And that is something I can see getting neglected pretty often. So I think it would be helpful to maybe have a schedule um, or part of a checklist where you're just always making sure that those instruments are maintained. Another thing that really kind of plays into that is making sure that you're using the correct tip on your scaler. All, almost all scalers that we have in the United States come with three tips. Unfortunately, the majority of practices that I know or the majority of the practices I go into are only ever using one tip. I get why they're using that tip because of the name of that tip is called the universal tip. And in theory, it's good on the crowns of the teeth and it's good below the gum line. However, it's really inefficient on the crowns and it's too wide and too big to really get into a periodontal pocket or into a furcation area. So going through your equipment, making sure you have three tips for your systems um, and use what I call the beaver tail, which is a wide, broad um, scaler that is used to remove all the calculus off the crowns of the teeth and then switch to the periodontal tip will actually make a huge difference in the amount of, or the length of time it takes to clean the, the mouth because you're using the right instrument in the right place and it makes a huge difference. One of the comments I heard once at a practice that I thought was just really kind of hit the nail on the head for me was 
um, one of the, the technicians goes, this is like going from driving a Yugo to a Mustang when it comes to cleaning the crowns of the teeth. And I'm like, yeah, because we're not taking all day to clean the crowns. Um, so using the two tips makes a huge difference in, in um, the procedure, the speed of the procedure. Yeah, and I love that because then the animal's under anesthesia for less time um, and it's mm -hmm. just so much more efficient for the practice. So really, that, yes, that's awesome. Yep. Another thing that we have to think about is polishing. And when we when we're scaling the teeth, we are actually etching the teeth. No matter how light a touch we do, it's just kind of a, a side effect. So we want to make sure that we're always polishing that out. We want to make we want to have that tooth as smooth as possible when we're done. The problem is most of the, the manufactured polish that we get is going to be coarse or medium grit, which actually kind of leaves micro etches in and of itself. So if you think about if you've ever used sandpaper on wood, you want that super fine finish, you're going to go to the finest sandpaper you can get. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in using fine, or I actually make my own pumice using flour, pumice, and glycerin and mixing it till I get to a nice cookie dough type of consistency, about a 50-50 mixture. And it may not smell like cherries and it's kind of gray and ugly, but the dog doesn't care. And it is a great way to ensure that those teeth are super smooth when we're done with the, the cleaning. The other thing when we're polishing is to slow down. Everybody, it's the last thing, right? And people are going like, are you done yet? Are you done yet? So take your time when you're polishing. We need to have a little bit of time to smooth those etches out. That's one of my biggest tips when it comes to, you know, finishing that dental procedure. I think those are great tips. Um, and I think that that etching that happens maybe isn't something that all technicians are cognizant of. So I'm glad you brought that up. I have one more that okay. will change everybody's world. Okay. Ooh, tell us. I know it's kind of cool, right? Um, when think about when you go to the dentist yourself, one of the last things you do before you walk into that dental office is you brush your teeth, mm -hmm. right? Plaque is super easy to remove with the toothbrush. It is not easy to remove with a scaler. So once I've I've actually chart first because I want to see what the gingiva looks like before it's, you know, touched by a scaler. Um, but I will go ahead and take a soft bristle brush. And I just thoroughly brush all of the teeth, just water alone. You know, I don't have to do anything, um, but water alone. I thoroughly brush all of the teeth. And then I use my air water syringe with both buttons pushed down and I kind of power wash the mouth. And what I've done is not only have I gotten rid of a majority of the plaque on the teeth, I've gotten rid of any other <clears throat> quote unquote stuff the dog might have had on his teeth that shouldn't be there. <laughs> and it gives me a cleaner work environment. And then I can go ahead and, and I've reduced the amount of bacteria that's there to aerosolize. So it actually gives you kind of a fresher area to work in, less aer aerosolization of the bacteria. And then you can just really dry the teeth a little bit and the calculus is gonna pop out at you as white or sometimes a yellow color and just go after the calculus with your scaler. It does speed up the time again um, of those procedures. And it just gives you a more, you know, a nicer environment to work in. And then a lot of times people say, well, what about the toothbrush? Well, you don't want to share brushes, but what I do is, is keep the brush, put it in a cup of chlorhexidine during the rest of the procedure. And then I'm going to go ahead and just power wash that out, send it home with the pet. They've got a toothbrush now. And um, it's a great way to, to speed up that procedure quite a bit. Very cool. Mary, I've never heard of anybody doing that. So thank you for that tip. Yeah, it's one of those things we did for years with research and it's just something I've carried through because it does speed up the time a lot. My last tip is to go ahead and create goodie bags, dental goodie bags. Um, and that can include maybe samples, maybe that toothbrush and a sample of toothpaste, a special discharge for dentistry that includes before and after pictures and a diagram of the mouth to show where there was anything that was done, if there was something procedurally done to the patient, um, and kind of personalize those a little bit. The pet owners really, um, really like that. And they love the fact that now this is about my pet. Sending home a set of the dental x-rays, a printout of the x-rays can also make a huge difference to kind of bonding that uh, pet owner to, to your practice. So 
make sure we we make them feel special that they've come in and entrusted their pet to us and we've been able to help their pet. And now we want to make sure that, you know, I always kind of say I put the ball in their court. I've done what I can do for the mouth, but now the ball's in their court to keep the mouth healthy between the next dental cleaning. Yeah, I love that. I think that is a great way to sort of um, help tie in the value of the dental cleaning. And also, like you said, to sort of put the ball in their court and um, encourage them to to keep it up at home, right? Because you did all this stuff, you're showing them a picture of it, you're giving them some tools to continue it at home. So it's a great way to sort of um, really drive that point home. And also remind them it's not a one and done. We get our teeth cleaned every six months. So even if we do a good job at home, and even if they do a great job with their pet, we probably need to see them back and have them cleaned again. Well, Mary, these are such great tips. I think you gave some really great information today that technicians can take with them into practice. So thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about my passion and that teeth rule. So I appreciate it. They do rule and you are such the dental guru. So thank you. And thank you to DECRA for partnering with us for this edition of vet to vet Check out NAVC's Vetfolio.com for more of our V2V discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, great patient care starts with self-care.